Well, I rejoice in this cold weather because Chris Kurtz is with us. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Our baptism service was such a rich mercy to my soul. And just thank you, Lord, for your saving ways and encouraging us uh, with these new believers and those who wanted to publicly profess their faith in Christ. Um, This morning, we're going to be looking at trials and why God brings them. And so I would like to go to his throne and, and ask him to meet us in a special way and to bless us here this morning. So let's go to the throne of grace. Father, we come before you and we're on a subject that we need your spirit to teach us through this word. God is countercultural. It's against this world. And so we pray, Lord, let us think the thoughts of God. Let us believe Your Word. Purify hope. God, drive out false hopes in every one of our hearts and let us exult in the instrument that You use to do such a good work. And so Lord, we open up our hearts to You here now this morning, raw, asking purify our hope. God, do Your work in each one of our hearts and give us wisdom. This morning we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 5, last week we began a new chapter in our study through Romans, and I also introduced a new section. This is Romans chapter 5 through verse 8. We're calling it the fruits of justification. When you're made right with God, what are the fruits that come forth from that relationship of being at peace now with God? And in our time together last week, we began unfolding Romans 5, 1 through 11, We're breaking it down into three sections. The first section is we exult in the hope of glory. We're people longing for that finish line and where we'll be made perfect forever. This morning we're going to look at exulting in tribulations. And then our third section will be exulting in our reconciliation with God. So our section last week is we exult in the hope of glory. And our first is that we now have peace with God, having been justified by faith in Christ alone. We now are at peace with our God instead of enmity. And so the great gift of God is peace. Oh, before I go on, if you get cold and want to go inside, you feel free to go inside. It's being live streamed in there. Um, It's not a a sign of weakness, okay? So it's just a sign of being cold. It's not a big deal. Secondly, we stand in grace because we are now at peace with God. We have been ushered into a relationship with God and all of His favor, all of His power, all of His grace is toward us to bring us to this third point that now we exult in the hope of glory. That grace will make sure His children are brought safely to the finish line and glorified forever. These truths have been growing in my heart all week. As I've been meditating on them further, and I feel like I might just preach Romans 5, 1 through 2 again this morning, but self-control says we're going to march on. If you'll look in Romans 5, 3, and not only this, and not only this, I kind of feel like a kid on Christmas morning after what we saw last week. It is too much for a person really to to take it all in, that you have peace with God and you stand in grace and you exult in glory. The ramifications of those truths are endless and far-reaching. You think it'd be better to just do the hand mic? Well, you think it'll still pick up the wind as much, Zach? You think? Is, Is it too distracting with the wind? Then let's go. I hate handheld mics. And now... Not only this, I want you to hear this, there's more. (laughs) After last week, I thought, I can die and go to heaven, there's no more. There's actually more to exult in. What more could there be after what we looked at? Well, let's look what, what Paul tells us. But we also exult in our tribulations. The exact same word, we exult with this great joy and praise to our God. We're to have the same exaltation and peace and grace and glory in our tribulations. So what is this? It doesn't compute. How does our world view suffering? Well, this generation has no place for it. When it comes, we we fold and we melt and we say, this isn't right. This is unfair. This makes my life 
meaningless. I give up. I quit. I'm undone. Just, it's a whole world designed to have no suffering. And, and when it does come in, something's broken and wrong and we've got to get rid of it. Well, how is the church of God to view suffering? Unfortunately, today we're just told it's the devil. The reason you're suffering is because of the devil and God can't stop it or control it. We're preached a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. For Job's friends, what you, what you, what'd you do wrong? We get prayer groups to get rid of it by prayer and positive thoughts. I don't even know what that means. To heal it. And as I was studying, I come across two schools of thought in our day and age that have crept into the church. One's called Stoicism, which you would translate this verse like this. We rejoice even though we are suffering. And it's like a Stoic is don't let suffering get to you. Don't let it touch you. Don't care. Suffering is you just grind through it and you say, praise God. You smile, you say, praise God, and you grit and grind through it. You don't admit how bad you're suffering. You don't care about what you've lost. And many in the church get through trials in this way. And it works to some extent, but it makes you hard and not compassionate to other people's suffering. And I think of Job when he was struck down, he ripped off his clothes and shaved his head and screamed. And it says that Job did not sin. And then there's the masochist, who you would re- translate it this way, we rejoice for our suffering. I just love hard things, they, they make you stronger. What doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Sorry, they're sticking. We feel like we're martyrs. And so we're just masochists. And what I want to ask you this morning is how does the Bible tell us to view suffering? And I want you to hear it's quite different. And I want you to hear the Apostle Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit. He says we exult in our tribulations. And I want you to hear what Jesus said to His Apostles. In John 16, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. In Acts 14.22, the going and strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. 1 Thessalonians 3.3 says, So that no man may be disturbed by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we've been destined for this. And Philippians 1.29, For to you it's been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. So what is before us is so countercultural. It's just against human nature. It's otherworldly. That we need to dig into this passage and just say, I want to exult in my tribulations honestly and truthfully. I spend most of my time trying to mitigate against trials and hard times that could befall me. I buy insurances against them. I try to avoid them. And at best, I, I seek to endure them. But there's something before us this morning that could lead you to exult in your tribulations. What would happen with a church of God who exults in tribulations? The whole world would take notice and say, what is the hope within you? And in the same way that I exult in peace with God and grace and the glory to come, that is the exaltation that we are to have in our tribulations because we'll see this morning they're married and they work together hand in hand. And to think that some people are out golfing. We're watching football or flying planes over our heads. I'm going to give you your outline. Paul gives us three reasons that we can exalt in our tribulations. And the first is this present experience, which is tribulations. We're to have a positive response. We're to exalt. And then Paul's going to give us the proper perspective so that we can do that, and it's knowing. And so let's look first at our present experience. 
our present experiences, we exult in our tribulations. It's just assumed that we will have them. The life that we live, and I want you to hear this, though you have peace with God and stand in grace and you're going to be glorified, it will be a path of suffering to glory. Yes, we're favored by God, but we will be afflicted by God. We have peace with God, but we're at war in this world on our way to our true home. All hell is set against you this morning. There's been a fall and we live under its curse and we suffer decay and sickness and sufferings and persecution from this world. Yet last week, we are given all of His resources of grace in these tribulations and battles that we will face on our way to glory. You're not hung out there with nothing. You have the grace of God as you enter into these tribulations that God has decreed and will bring into your life. And so you have been appointed for glory and you have been appointed to tribulations. And so this morning what I want to look at is what are tribulations? It's an interesting word. It means pressure, anguish, affliction, oppression. It's really this idea of squeezing. It referred to the crushing of olives to extract the oil. And some of you just can feel it this morning with your trials. They're just squeezing and they're coming down and they're pressure. James calls, James calls them multicolored, variegated trials. There's so many in our midst. And just thinking through them this morning, I had a list of about 45 different trials that I know of in this congregation. And they're very deep, hard, serious squeezings and afflictions. We're a bunch that are in tribulation. And so my question this morning, is this how God treats His children? And I would say only His choicest. Without tribulations, the writer of Hebrews says you're illegitimate children. To not have tribulations is, is, is a curse. The worst affliction is to not be afflicted at all. So this is our present experience. We have to think about this then God's way because His children have many tribulations on the way to glory and somewhere along the way, we, we think God's favor is that we won't have tribulations. And so just our first point, this will be the journey of the, children, of the child of God. You will have tribulations. Take heart, Jesus said, I've overcome the world. And so I want to look secondly then in our outline at the positive response. And Paul tells us what should be our response to these many tribulations is to exalt. This praising of God and joyful praising of our God. I want this badly. I want to be able to rejoice and sing and have joy inexpressible and have praise for my Father in heaven who brings tribulations into my life. Guys, there's a way to exalt, there's a way to not grumble, there's a way to not wallow in self pity. There's a way to not complain about how dark the world is right now. There's a way to not be a stoic. To pretend it doesn't exist or doesn't hurt. To make believe, to, to kind of salve your conscience and say it could be worse. There's something better for the children of God. I want you to exult. Don't you want that? Glory is the most easiest thing I've ever had to exult in. It just takes my heart away. But to exult in my tribulations, I just can't get this. I need God's perspective because mine struggles to exult. And yet Paul says we exult in them. The grammar here is telling us where it's on account of the trouble, account of the tribulations we exult. You could translate it because of. We actually rejoice in the difficulty. And just get this, we don't rejoice in the pain. It's not, um, I just love pain. I like to hurt. I like tears. But it's to not respond like this world. This life is their only hope. And anything that threatens that is to be hated and despised and not exalted in for sure. So we need help with this. And I want to thank the Lord for giving us this help this morning. 
And that will be our third point. As we have our present experience, tribulations, the positive response is that we're to exult in them. And our third point then is a proper perspective, and it's this word knowing. This is what you, you need to know. The Christian has a renewed mind, and he's renewing it in truth. And so you've got to think different about trials than the way the world thinks about them. So we need knowing. I'm going to give him a sec. <coughs> knowing means to understand, to comprehend, and it deals with experiential knowledge. This is something we're, we're getting in the Christian life and we're growing in it. And so it's in the perfect tense, which it's an event accomplished in the past with results existing afterwards. Daniel Wallace said it's not so much to indicate the past action, but rather the present state of affairs resulting from the past action. So you, you understand what God's doing in trials and every day now you have this existing result of knowing what God's doing in your life. And so it's a participle. So it's filling out this idea of how can we exult? And here's the only way you'll ever be able to exult is you need to be knowing these things. Grace does not let us exult magically. It comes through truth. What truth is it that helps me then to exult in my tribulations? What is it that can take that which is most opposed to our makeup and can actually cause us to exult in tribulation? And so what is it, brethren, that we are to know? And before we get, begin, I just want to make a quick observation from our text. In Romans 5.2, <coughs> last week, we have the hope of glory. We exult in it. And now in verse 4, this knowing is going to produce hope. And it's the hope of glory. And so what I want you to see is that trials serve in growing what we exult in in verse 2. In verse 2, we exult in the hope of glory, finishing this race with God. And so trials do something that make our hope in glory greater and stronger, and so we exult because I exult in the hope of glory and trials come and they purify that hope and they make it stronger and greater and we long more for it. So because I exult in glory, I can exult in tribulations because they're making my hope and glory stronger, better, bigger. If God doesn't bring tribulations, what will you hope in? The scene, this world, this life, my family. I will hope in all the wrong things if God doesn't bring tribulations. And because He brings them to make me exult in the hope of glory, I exult in my tribulations. Because they create and they strengthen hope. They are not to destroy you, but to prepare you. Trials are for transformation which will give you a greater hope and glory because you know you're children of God. And so let's look at this process with me then this morning. And so in verse 3, and not only this, but we exult in our tribulations, knowing, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And I want to look at this word brings about. Uh, it means to make or to produce. So this is what it, it produces. This is what suffering and tribulation and all the squeezing in our life is they bring this about. And they bring about perseverance. It's a Greek word, hupomeno. Meno means to abide or to remain. And hupo means under. And so these trials come and they give us hupomeno. They give us the ability to abide or to remain under the testings and the trials. So all of this squeezing and pressures and tribulation Produce one who can abide under it. And a better word, I think, would be steadfast. What it produces in, in saints is it makes them steadfast. When you first get saved, it's just every little trial just throws you and flips you and you get confused and you're like, am I a child of God? And you're, you're always struggling. And so the trials are going to come and they're going to mature you and strengthen you and make you steadfast on your way to glory. They're going to make you like leather. <laughs> he or she continues steadfast in their journey to heaven. 
As hard as it gets, your focus is Christ who is seated at the right hand of God. And now it, your, your focus isn't, how do I get this off? How do I get rid of it? That's the way uh, uh, an unbeliever is. That, that's not the preoccupation of your soul. The child of God is getting stronger and, and perseverance where it's not always, how do I get rid of this at any cost? But God, have your way and, and produce perseverance in me as a child of God. He doesn't flinch. He stays on the course despite squeezings. I see more people get off the course because of squeezings. And what this is doing, the squeezings are to make you stronger, to stay on the course that's going to get to the finish line called glory. He doesn't try to get himself off. He learns how to rest in God's timing of what he's doing and when he will bring you out. Remember 1 Peter 1.6, he says, In this you greatly rejoice, you exult, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. And we said that if necessary was not according to you, but according to God. And these trials begin to produce one who rests in God's timing and what he's doing and what he wants to do in your life versus just get me out of this. I don't like pain. A new believer tries to avoid difficulties and get out from under them. And a mature one knowing is steady under fire and does not quit his or her post. And they know the only path is through them to glory. These tribulations cause them to be more and more a person who perseveres. It, it strengthens you. I'm not easily disheartened. I'm not ready to quit at every difficulty. And this is the beauty of what he's doing even in our midst in so many of your hearts. Tribulations, I would say it's like focusing the camera on glory and Christ is the finish line. And so these tribulations cause you to see clear what is the hope of glory. And they take away your hope of this earth and the, the pain and the squeezing say, I want to get to that finish line so badly where all my afflictions are released and I'll never have them again. And so tribulations get your focus and they get you seeing the reality of the glory and where we want to finish. So we endure in hope because it's promised and certain. And so what I want you to catch is that God is not against me. So in tribulations, the first thing I usually hear is why is God doing this? Is He against me? And I want you to hear verse 1, you have peace with God. You stand in grace. It's not because He's against you, it's because He's for you. So your first question isn't, is God against me? Thank you, God, for being for me. Thank you for purifying my hope and squeezing me and bringing tribulations. You're, I want you just to hear that. You're not, God's not mad at you. He has peace with you. And you stand in grace. That's why he squeezes. So quit getting squeezed and saying, God's my enemy. He's trying to hurt me. He's against me. You've got to fight it. He's doing something in me. John Newton captured this well. He said, I ask the Lord that I might grow in love and faith and every grace, more of thy salvation know, and to seek more earnestly your face. What a great prayer, and I hope that's the prayer of every heart here this morning. And he said, I thought God would just come through and do this amazing and miraculous thing for me, just make me happier in my salvation. But instead, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yeah, with his own hand, more it seemed, intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed, cast out my feelings and laid me low. Lord, why is this I cried? Will thou pursue thy worm to death? Tis in this way the Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that they may seek thy all and all in me. To break the schemes of all your earthly joys so that you would find your all and all 
in Him. I exult in my tribulations. Amen. I prayed with a brother before I came out here. He was going through a huge trial of losing his grandkids. And his prayer was so beautiful. And it's losing those grandkids has caused him to hope and glory like never before. And he had the choice to choose one or the other. And he said, the love of God that's been shed abroad in my heart next week causes me to choose this path that God has for me to glory. I pray that every one of you can exult. And you can exult with tears coming down your face because of the pain. But I exult in a God who loves me and squeezes me so I won't get off the path. And I will narrow in and keep longing for glory over this present darkness. And we know, in verse 3 then, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and secondly then, perseverance brings about proven character, 1 Peter again, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. That here's the word, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's the same connection, the tribulations, the fires are going to result in praise and glory and honor when you get to glory. And so that word here is, is the Greek word is called dokimos, and it was referred to metal, and the, the, the refiner putting metal in the fire and boiling off these impurities of it, and what would come out is this tested metal. And that, that was the beautiful thing. Dokimos would come out, and adokimos would boil off, and it would be called the, the proof of your faith. And it's used for the testing of precious metals then for the genuineness from testing gold. And you just kept putting gold in that fire again and again and boiling off impurities. And I've said it before, until you could look and see your own reflection in the gold. And God is doing that in each life. He's, he's sticking you in the fire and He's boiling off impurities and unbelief and false hopes. And, and He's just getting this faith that trusts and loves and believes this message. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He just keeps purifying that in your hearts. The one who does not shrink back from tribulation, but stays on the path. Whoa. Thank you, guys. We probably don't need this thing, but it's all right. So the one who does not shrink back, but stays on the path, it produces a purified faith, a genuineness, a proven character, and and here's why. What trials show you is what are you really living for? And when they're over, you realize the thing that I was living for before this trial was something temporal. And God's burned it off. And now I, 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 I see even in my own heart, I'm living for another world. I'm living for the kingdom of God. And so my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Trials show me I'm not living for my house, my car, my wife. I'm living for Jesus Christ. And so I love the refiner's fire. And quite simply, I've joined God in His main pursuit in my life. And His main pursuit in my life is Christ's likeness. And so I will exult in tribulations because it goes to the root, it goes to my bosom sins, my unbeliefs and my false hopes and it purifies me (laughs) i think we should just maybe take it down maybe maybe okay i'll preach while you guys take it down guys pretend like this is not happening okay so what's going to come out is this tempered metal And it will not, and catch this, tempered metal will not come from a gentle breeze and sunshine. Isn't that what everybody wants? I just want easy. I like sunshine and the nice soft breeze. And I'm telling you, you'll never get tempered metal that way. You're just going to have a bunch of adokimos all over your life and heart. So I rejoice in my tribulations because they come and they boil off all this junk and slop. 
<laughs> this is it, man. So, what a message for Americans. I need tempered metal. I need trials. I need coronaviruses and governments coming after me and people breaking properties and all this stuff. I, I need hardships and I need tribulations and I need these things if I'm going to hope and finish the race that's been set before me and so I, I can exult in tribulations. I've been through some wars and I've been in trials and I've had sleepless nights and I've failed and I've feared and I've doubted and at the end of the trial the peaceful fruit of righteousness comes out with tested metal that trusts and believes God and His promise, this enduring promise of glory that He'll bring all of His children to. And that is what I see in this church. I see some warriors who have been tested. And no matter what comes against you now, you hope and you believe and you're not easily moved away. And because of that, I exult in tribulation. That's why Titus 2 says older men teach the younger men and older women teach the younger women. You know why? Because your faith has been tempered and you can help the younger ones learn and journey and understand these things. So tribulations come and you're not shaken because your faith is purified and tested and approved. And so you don't, you don't get tribulations. Uh, if, they don't, if God doesn't bring tribulations, you stay in unbelief and weakness and you're a quitter and you're shallow and you got a dokimos all over your life and purities that fill your heart. And so we thank God for tribulations. And now our last point is perseverance brings about proven character. And per- proven character brings about hope. And so my question this morning is how, do, how does tribulation bring hope? It tends to produce hopelessness. We come full circle. We started with hope in verse 2, and now we're going to end with hope. Hope is because of justification by faith in Christ alone. And the one who believes in that can have absolute hope that God will bring you to glory. And so we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And trials bring us back to it. And they make us more certain that we belong to God than we did before because we love Him more than the passing away world. They've proclaimed to us where our hope really lies. And they've shown us that our feet are on earth, but our heart is in heaven. And they really proclaim that I really do believe this. And anything that comes against me, I can't be taken away from my hope in Christ. It's the same hope. We're just more certain of it because of tribulations. And I, uh, Nate Thompson brought up this week with Abraham. And Abraham in Genesis, he, he believes God and he's justified. And we see that he, he made some mistakes in his journey and there was some unbelief even. But by the time he gets to Genesis 22, as an older man now, around 99, go offer up Isaac. You finally get the son of promise. Go put him on, a, on an altar and drive a knife from him and burn him up as a sacrifice for me. And Abraham just jumps up and goes and does it. And he's just, we'll be right back. And he says if he drove a knife through his chest, he knew in, in Hebrews that he would just raise him from the dead. And what happened is, is he's been tempered, he's, he's grown in his trust and his confidence in the word of God of what he says is what he will do. And that's this increased hope in God and his promise. So I exult in trials because hope is only heightened in them. Nothing on earth can help me in my trials. Only my hope in Christ. And I believe the church in America has been hurt by its lack of suffering. I've told you before, J.I. Packer said the Puritans, their average lifespan was 29 years old. They said they, they lived as if this was the dressing room for the big game. And they were focused and they they knew and it was hard labor just to survive. And now our battle, I hear parents, my battle is how do I not spoil my children versus bury them when the Puritans were growing? The result is there's just so little longing for the return of Christ. 
There's just so many tent stakes being put down and we use religion to put down more tent stakes. How do I, how do I get a happy life? How do I get blessed here with prosperity? And just very little hoping. The joy of being a dying man with a dying man is their tent stakes just seem like grass. They, all the stuff goes away and all that matters is this hope of glory. And so what happens when trials come is we're so earthy, we're undone. And we turn to drugs and therapists and special groups. There, there's the only hope that I can find in my tribulations is to meet them with faith and knowing what Paul has just said. Faith that this gospel is true, that we do have peace with God, and we do stand in grace, and we will be brought to glory, and that trials are given by God to strengthen us, and they're needed, and it's God's way of causing us to be a people of hope. God, thank you for tribulations, so I can hope and exult in hope of the glory of God, and not live for this life, but live for the eternal life. Do you see why we exult in our tribulations? They lead us deeper into hope, and they boil off the things that starve hope. We saw that during COVID. God did not bring afflictions. The psalmist said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. We'd all go astray without tribulations. Trials are my scheduled tune-ups for glory. I need tribulations to keep my hope fixed on glory and not the glory of this world. Amen? I exult in my tribulations and I thank you, God, for pruning my heart to hope only in you. Not a world that's passing away, but that is the grace of our Almighty God doing that in each one of our hearts. And so I exult in my squeezings. And one last point, it's not on your outlines. If I don't know if you guys can see them or not, or if you're inside. It says that we know that this hope will not disappoint. What happens with every other hope? It dies, it disappoints. What happens if you're living under law, trying to get God's approval? It's going to disappoint on the last day. Pharisee, on the last day, it's going to disappoint when you see God. But for this hope, it will never, ever disappoint. In 1 Peter 2, 6, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. It's a double emphatic. and absolutely no way will you ever be disappointed. The one who hopes in this, the way Abraham hoped, you're not going to get before God on the last day and ever. No way will you ever be disappointed that you believed in God through Jesus Christ and this promise. Tribulations increase his hope. And on the day when you hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, you'll never be disappointed. You'll thank God for every tribulation and how he held you and persevered you and to hope you will not be disappointed. All the pressures and squeezings produced hope was fulfilled greater and more magnificent than I ever hoped or imagined on the last day. 2 Thessalonians 1 6, for after all, it's only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire. All the tribulations will be released, and all the pressures that you're under, you will never go under again. I think it's time to be finished. So just walk away with this the one who hopes in this gospel, you'll never be disappointed. And there's an eternal relief coming where you'll bathe in the excellencies of the Godhead and there'll be no more tribulations for all of eternity. So brethren, that's why we consider it all joy. That's why you exalt. Amen? James says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, Dokimos, he'll receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him which we'll see next week that the love of God has been shed abroad in your hearts. And so I close with William Cooper. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break and blessings on your head. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, 
but sweet will be the flower. This is pure gold. We have to get this or be knocked off kilter with every tribulation. And this is what we have to get, children of God, to where it causes our hearts to exult in every tribulation that you're sitting here being squeezed this morning and let it give you hope past this world that is futile and a wrong hope. What a glorious gospel that we have. Let us hope in our God. Let's pray. Father, I thank You. I thank You that You love us. I thank You that You gave Your Son for us. I thank You that He has brought about peace. And He's brought us into the pure favor of Almighty God. And that favor is going to bring us into an eternal reward. That is no eye has seen or ears heard. It's unbelievable what You have stored up for the children of God. And so God, thank You for trials. Thank You for tribulations that purify this hope. And don't let us fix our hope on wrong things that are dying here and that will hurt us. God, thank You that You take away our spiritual cataracts by tribulations so we can see clearly the hope of glory. And where this finish line is Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of faith. So God, strengthen us and let us run the race that is set before us. And let us be a people who are countercultural, who exult in our tribulations. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.